but it uh, uh, on Sunday. But <clears throat> th thank you for coming back tonight. We're glad to get back uh, to our evening services. That's close enough uh, uh, for for the new year. And I'm excited um, <clears throat> about the the subject matter that we're going to be talking about for the next uh, five weeks, and that's uh, building strong families. Um, I think there's a lot of layers to that. Uh, we have, ex I, I was excited because when I think about, uh, you guys don't know this, or you, you may not understand it, but um, when I'm thinking about teaching a class or, or preaching a message, uh, you get used to kind of where people sit, and you kind of see their faces, like, and so you think about, you know, who your, who your audience is and, and, and what you're sharing the good news is about any of it is I'm sharing out of the Word of God, so I don't have to worry about curating anything that has to be perfect or, or geared just to Keith or geared just to Kathy because it's the Word of God. It's applicable for, for everybody, right? But I'm excited because I, there's a lot of unique uh, situations in here when you say family. There are families that are uh, still raising kids. There's families that have had kids and uh, families that you know are are grandparents and, and have never had kids. There's just all manner of of folks, and uh, I think what's great about this uh, is that in this sense of a strong family, it's talking about uh, the unit of people taking care of each other, not just uh, a single family, uh, you know, a single core family unit of. A mom and mommy and a daddy and a boy and a girl and a dog and a cat, right? It's not that's not exactly what we're talking about. So I'm excited about it. Uh, I think it's a, a fantastic way to start off the new year. Uh, we do want to <clears throat> we do want to start off in prayer uh, as we as we try to do every Wednesday night um, and just just lift up some things. I know there's been a lot going on in everybody's world, uh, but a couple things that jumped to the front of my mind. Uh, we do want to pray for uh, uh, the Campbell family, uh, uh, lost uh, soup, and I don't know his, uh, the, the lady who's with him, I don't know her name, Martha, but uh, Shirley, yeah. Uh, so I don't, I, don't, I don't know all the details, and I'm, again, it doesn't really matter, but he is having a service, uh, I believe they're having a visitation on Friday. Uh, and then a, a service on Saturday. So we'll probably may, uh, uh, at least share that, that status because Soup did, was a part of this church for a long time and just a part of this community. He, he taught Pastor Gary when you were in junior high, third grade. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, and to my understanding, was still substitute teaching to this day at 80-whatever years old, uh, 85 years old. I don't even know what his actual first name is. Wayne. Okay, I knew that. I just I couldn't think of it. But I'm pretty sure that uh, as far as the government's concerned, his name's Soup. Because, you know, if you just go by that for a while, then all your mail starts showing up as that. And I guess that makes it legal, all right? It's an alias. He started out as a PE teacher. Uh-huh. Oh, Campbell Ups. But uh, if, if you don't, uh, if you ever want to, to hear a great story, we have a book, and I know we've got some copies around here called Perseverance. And he's got a story in there about uh, just an amazing time in his life when God did an amazing uh, thing. It doesn't, it, we changed the names in the stories because it was published uh, uh, nationally. The book was, it was on Amazon available for a little while. We mailed it out to pretty much everybody in the community a copy got a copy of it but uh it, it's got a great story uh about soup in there and uh uh anyhow <clears throat> uh so I want to pray for that family uh again their his granddaughters were in our youth group his uh daughter uh was came to the church and all of them were a part of it for a long time uh and I, this is going to sound a little silly but I hope you'll bear with me but uh, I, I want to lift up in prayer the young man that got hurt in the football game uh, on Monday night. Uh, his name is um, Damar, what's his name? Hamlin. And normally I wouldn't say a whole lot about anything with football, but here's what I have watched, and, and maybe you've noticed it. Uh, we actually 
kind of caught it uh, right after it happened. We were watching another program. Uh, in fact, I think we were watching the Rose Bowl or something. You guys had just left the house. They, Kathy and Gary had come over for dinner, and we were the kids were leaving the house, so we flipped it over to ESPN, and we saw the ambulance on the field, and they said, all we know is we've been doing CPR for nine minutes. So some of you guys may not even know the story. But this young man took a pretty run-of-the-mill hit, uh, just made a pretty run-of-the-mill tackle. But when the impact of that receiver, who kind of leaned into him, hit him at just the precise moment to make his heart stop whenever he hit him. And so after the hit, it was about six seconds all total later, he just collapsed right on onto the ground. Um, of course, everybody was in immediate shock. It was one of those things like uh, the, the old video of Lawrence Taylor when they broke Joe Theismann's leg, and he's going, y'all got to get here now. Like, come on, get out here. And that's what was going on, but they huddled up around him because they had to, his heart had stopped uh, and all that. But here's why I'm, I'm saying I don't know this, this young man. Uh, all I know is what they're reporting, and of course right now everything reported is going to be good news, right? He had a foundation that it is a pretty cool story. He has a foundation that raised money for toys for a daycare center that his mom runs. Uh, they had a goal of $2,700, and as of yesterday night, they were at $5.2 million uh, that had been raised for this daycare center. So it's going to change that whole community uh, where his mother lives and works. His mother was 16 years old when he was born, so she's a very young lady with the son. He's 24. He's a year older than my son. So I can only imagine what they were going through for those nine minutes on the field, why all that's happening. But here's why, here's why I, I'm just praying. I, there was a good report today that they took him from 100% oxygen down to 50% oxygen, and he's responding great. Uh, they, they think that he's going to be, as soon as they do everything that they have to do because he was without for so long, they're going to just keep walking him through this process. But I have not heard the word prayer be used on television as much as I have in the last three days. And I haven't heard anybody talk about a lot of hopes and wishes. There's been a few statements out there that were, you know, our hopes are, our, well, we can hope and wish, but uh, there's a question in, in, our, in your book that says, what did your parents used to tell you when you were a kid? And what did you tell your kids when you were little, and my mom used to say something kind of crude to me. I won't repeat it, but it was something to the effect of you can wish in one hand, and y'all know the rest, right? And, and so I know that we can pray, and God moves things. I believe fully that there are a lot of people that of faith that rose up and said prayer matters, prayer's important. People went to the hospital and stood outside and prayed, and so won't it be a great thing, just because God is God, won't it be a great thing when this young man is healed and restored and everybody can, nobody's going to go, oh, the doctors are going to go, no. Look at how many times people were asking for prayer. Look at all the prayer that's been going on for this young man. And I believe it could have an eternal impact. And as Jesus said when they asked him, they said, why did this young boy have this issue? Was it because of his father or because of his grandfather? He said, no. It's just for the glory of God. So I'm excited about the healing of this young man. I, I'm, I've been praying for him diligently. I don't know him. I wouldn't be able to pick him out of a lineup if he was on my own fantasy football team. Uh, but he's not on offense, so he wouldn't be. But anyway, I do want to pray for them and their family. And then I don't want to minimize anything else that we've got going on, but do you guys have anything else? Miss Kathy, that we can pray for. Yes, yes, Case and Trammell, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, I saw that on...
Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, whether or not the new year rolls over, the calendar changes, life is just life, right? Life goes on and things happen. Um, so we want to pray uh, for these things. Can we do that tonight? Can you just join with me? Father, we come before you tonight <clears throat> and we just set you up above all these things. Lord, we exalt you. We, we honor you. We give you glory because God, without you, God, none of, none of our lives would even be possible. The, the healings that we've experienced, the joy that we have, the, 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 provi- the provision that you've given, all of that, Lord, would be for nothing if we don't set you first and give you thanks and, and glory for it. So, God, I praise you that even in these times of loss, Father, for, for the Campbell family, for, for his daughter, for their, all of his, his family, his grandchildren, Lord, I just pray for a special healing in their lives. God, let let his life and his legacy, Father, of service to you, let that be what rings out, God. Let that be what, what shows out more than anything through this time. God, we don't understand why things happen the way they do, but God, it doesn't change the fact that that's a man that served you and given you gr- uh, praise and honor for years and years as a witness to his family. So God, I just pray for them. I pray uh, God, for for this uh, the Walton family, Lord God, that they've experienced loss. And God, I pray for protection, uh, for healing in their lives. I thank you for your protection, God, for 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 Kaysen, Lord. I, it's amazing to see a young man walking in here in a walker and a neck brace, but giving praise and glory to his God. Lord, we thank you for this young man that's in a hospital tonight, even in, in Cincinnati, Lord God, for... For, the, for Mr. Hamlin and his family. Lord, I just pray for all of the millions of people that are engaged in that story. They're going to get an opportunity to see you at your finest, Lord God. Your work and your healing, Lord, is going to come. And God, it's just going to be something that nobody can deny, that nobody can second guess, but it's going to be only by your hand that it was done. God, we pray for... for uh, the Price family, Lord God, the entire church body, Lord God, that, that's going through that loss, not just of a son and of a friend, but God, just a, a, a piece of their, their, their family, Lord God, that's now missing. And without, Lord, without a lot of explanation, God, we just have to trust in you. We have to trust in your providence. We have to trust in your mercy. But more than anything, Lord, that you are the one that binds up the broken heart. So, God, I pray for healing and restoration in their lives. God, a touch every day for that that father, that mother, Lord, everybody who's experiencing this loss, that you just be their comfort and you be their guide. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray tonight. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Mr. Belding, yes. Yes, I'm. I, for some reason, I'm. I'm hearing little bits and pieces. I guess my ears are getting stopped up again, so I apologize. I keep going, huh, huh, huh. What? what? All right. If you guys have, uh, Larry's going to come around with the offering plate. Um, I was going to try this tonight. I don't usually show a lot of videos, but I was going to just try to show you guys. It's a quick little video, uh, and I thought it was great. Uh, it just talks about. The, the theme tonight, making God's word central. Go ahead.
There's lots of illustrations that you could use to talk about putting God first in your life. Uh, I didn't want to get all the sand out and all the stuff, but uh, one of the ones I've done with teenagers over the years is, you know, you have a big jar and you talk about all the things that are happening in your life, whether it's school or or activities or, in our cases, jobs and, and family and, and all those responsibilities. And you try to put all those in the jar like, like cups of sand, right? And you realize that when you try to put God in at the end, you, you run out of space. But somehow we always would take marbles like to represent God or, or you know, little ball bearings or something. And you try to put them in and you can't fit them in the jar, Fred. But when you start with the marbles, it doesn't matter how you do it. When you pour in all the sand and all the other stuff, it always seems to fit uh, uh, in there accordingly. When you put God first. Uh, another way to think about it, instead of just thinking about prioritization, because we all would like to be good at prioritizing in our lives. Uh, uh, if you read, uh, I think it's uh, Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's a great book. And I've read it when I went into leadership position in my job. I thought, oh, I got to read all these John Maxwell and Stephen Covey because I want to be the best boss I can be. But can I tell you, I'm not great at all the things. I, I've read, you know, the 21 most effective way, uh, ways of leadership and all these other things. But I'm, I fail and I fall short. And so even though I might sit down every day and make a list of what am I going to do today, what am I going to make first, and, and sometimes I neglect because I think, oh, well, it's a given, right, that God is first. But we can, if we are honest with ourselves, sometimes we skip that. We skip that, you know, maybe it's a, just a prayer when you get out of bed. Maybe it's a, a, an hour-long prayer when you start the morning. I'm just going to be honest, that's not typically my routine. I'm not, I'm not a morning person. So I'll be honest, sometimes I roll out of bed to the sound of an alarm telling me I got a conference call in 15 minutes, right? It's just, that, that's, my, that's my nature. But what I, what I find is when you take God and you put Him first in this way, and that is that you make Him the center, you make Him your rotation point uh, uh, of what's, what you're building everything else around. And so, you know, I watch a show uh, sometimes, uh, you would think it's, it's really goofy, and it is kind of nerdy, but it's called Lego Wars. Anyone seen this on, on television? No one's going to admit to it, right? Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, at first I thought, well, you know, it's their kids' toys, right? And, and I remember years ago, coming out of Christmas, George, I got a box of Legos. Excuse me, Lego. You don't call them Legos because it's just Lego. Okay, plural is still Lego. Uh, uh, but I got a box of Lego, and on the side of the box, it said something like ages 8 to 28 or, or something like that. And I just remember as a kid taking a little magic marker and crossing over that and putting 8 to 88 or, or something like that. Because I was like, nobody's too old to play with Lego, you know, when I was a kid. And if you notice now, if you go to the store, go down the toy aisle, and look on the boxes of Lego, it says it's ages 9 to 99. And I, I don't know how they stole it from me when I was 9 years old, but they stole my idea because you can never be too old to play with Lego. But what's fascinating about this show, and I won't get into all the details, but they just throw these challenges at these, these young men and women, and, and, and some of them are, have been doing it for years, their grandparents or whatever, but they say, we're going to build, you know, this amazing structure and you can hang it on one piece of Lego from the ceiling. And so it's critical when they're building that they, they take into account all the pieces that they're going to use, all the structure that they're going to use, and how they're going to build that so that when they get it attached to that one piece of string or whatever that's hanging from the ceiling, that somehow it all stays together because they have to anchor to one center point. If that piece that anchors to that center point is not there, it doesn't matter how elaborate their, their creation is or how many you know uh, creative ideas they have, if it's not anchored correctly, that thing's going to fall apart. 
And it's so devastating when you see these people. They spend 12 hours. I don't know how they break that up, but, you know, but on TV it says we get 12 hours to do this, and then they'll be at the end of the thing, and it'll just fall apart. And they're devastated, and they lose the round, and they have to go home or whatever. But our lives, if we look at it from necessarily not just saying, okay, I want to put God first, but we can look at God as the center point so that if we anchor everything that we do, everything we say, every decision and, and opportunity that we take, we put it around, is it going to anchor to this center point of God? And that's going to help you and it's going to help me understand if we're really living out this, this situation. So as we spend the next five weeks Lord willing, talking about building strong families. I want you to get that picture in your mind of it doesn't matter how much uh, uh, Facebook credit we get, uh, how cool our Christmas looked on Facebook, uh, how, you know, we got to go to a Mavericks game. Uh, That was our kids' Christmas present this year, and we had a good time. Uh, The Mavericks are just playing, like, out of their minds right now. They're never that good, but right now, for whatever reason, they're killing it. Uh, if you're a sports fan, I usually don't follow it that closely, but we had a good time. We posted some pictures, but it doesn't matter how fun all that stuff looks. If we come home and everything's in shambles, it doesn't make my my family stronger just going to a Mavericks game together. And so I want to go all the way back. If you have your Bibles and you want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to start there tonight. And I'm going to be reading from the New King James Translation. It should be on the screen. Um, this is going way back. This is uh, uh, scriptures that were given early to the Hebrew people to help them understand that uh, this was a way for them to enter into this relationship with God that would benefit them all the days of their life. Now, there are some people that would teach that we can't take these Old Testament scriptures and try to apply them anymore because we're under a new covenant. But I would tell you that what these scriptures are telling us does not somehow fight against what the new covenant says. In fact, it just solidifies and reiterates uh, all of the things that Jesus talked about in fact, if you, if you have it in your Bible, I don't know if you do, but uh, on the top of my thing, it says the greatest commandment. And do you remember that there was this confrontation with Jesus, and they said, well, what do you think is the greatest commandment? And, it, and when Jesus himself shared these things, he talked about this. He says in verse uh, uh, 2, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, it says that you may fear the Lord your God, keep all his statutes and commandments, which I command you, your sons and your grandsons, all the days in your life, and that your days may be prolonged. It's a, it's a promise. God gave this word as, a, as a, um, an agreement that he was coming into with the, the Israelite people to say, I am entering into a covenant with you. A covenant is a lot different than just a contract. I, I, this has been on me. If uh, uh, like you wouldn't believe, I was sharing this with Caden uh, and PJ. They got married on New Year's Eve, and she's here tonight. She's she's living here full time now. Uh, is going to student teach at Weatherford, so you're going to see a lot more of her. But I, I just shared this because it was so powerful when I read it. Is that a contract? Is me saying I'm going to do something, and you saying you're going to do something, and then we write it down and we agree to both meet our part of the bargain, right? And if you don't do what you're supposed to do, then you're in breach of contract. If I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I'm in breach of contract. And so then all of a sudden, this contract, whether you know one of us can be held accountable for it or not, is not really the issue. The contract itself has failed. You understand what I'm saying? A covenant is different because the parties in a covenant say, I am going to do my part, regardless of what happens. God says, I am going to cover you with my blood regardless. He told Noah, we talked about several weeks ago, no matter what, I'm never going to flood the earth again. I've made a covenant with you 
that I'm never going to do that again. And he makes this covenant with the Israelite people saying, if you'll just keep these commands, you will live a long and enduring life. And, in, and so when you look at it on the face of it, it almost looks like a contract because it looks like God saying, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. But what he's really saying is that if you'll do this, you'll experience this, these positive things. When you come into the realization that it doesn't matter which part of the covenant you're looking at, they all benefit you. They all benefit me. God doesn't benefit in any way other than His Word is upheld because of if we do what we say that in His Word to do, what it says in His Word to do, then He gets to just go, I told you. That's, the, that's all God has in this thing is to go, oh yeah, by the way, I can't lie. If you didn't figure that out, it says in His Word over and over again that it, it, it's, He cannot lie. So some people would say this is only to the Israelites. It's only talking to those people that, that, that these things have passed away that we don't have to live by these statutes or expect these things of our life. But I'm telling you that that's contrary to the Word of God. There is over and over, I, I didn't even highlight them and go through them, but right here it talks about, it says the, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God stands forever. Amen? The Word of the Lord uh, that creation is why creation came into existence. It produces faith. It brings us to salvation. It cleanses us as we embrace its message. These are all scriptures about what the Word of the Lord does. So if it's all of these things are true, uh, it reveals our attitudes and our motives. It strengthens and refashions us to be what God designs. It heals and delivers us, delivers us from trouble. It enables us to fight temptation. And uh, <clears throat> it's profitable to establish our beliefs, confront errors, correct our wayward ways, and teach us the righteous ways of the Lord. If all those things are true, and can I get an amen because they are, then we can still look at Deuteronomy and go, you know, this is probably good stuff. This is probably still something that we can live by. Paul commands us that we have to confront unbiblical ideals that lead to destruction. That word confront is a challenging word because not everybody's confrontational. All right? Uh... I, I I tell a funny story. I won't get into all the details because she would totally kill me. Uh, but we were out to eat with my wife and the kids. We were over in Dallas getting ready to go to the Mavericks game. And this little young waiter, he was kind of funny because we were going to order our food. And we, we said what we wanted. He was like, ooh, yeah, I don't know if I like that. I like this stuff. And I was like, dude, we already ordered. You don't tell us the specials after you order. You know, don't tell me that my pizza is going to be gross after I order it, you know. And uh, it was just a weird, you could tell he was pretty new at it, you know. And Zoe waited tables uh, for, for a couple of years, and so she's super uh, sympathetic to their plight. And, you know, she knows when they're struggling a little bit, so she's like, y'all be nice to him. You guys be nice to him. And, guys, you know how I feel about that. I can't be a jerk to a waiter. But there was one particular time he just said, he was like, hey, let me get you a refill. And uh, Amber goes to hand him his cup, her cup and she gets her straw. And he goes, no, leave your straw in it. And she's not trying to be ugly or anything. She goes, I don't want you touching my straw. Like just kind of just says, if you know my wife, she just sometimes says what she thinks. And the young man was like, uh, uh. Uh, and I was like, it's okay, man. Here, I'll leave my straw in my... He was trying to tell the difference between the two cups. I mean, it's a little waiter trick, right? But she just, for some reason, was like, I don't want you touching my straw. And so it felt like it was confrontational, right? But I can tell you that one of the endearing qualities of my wife is she's not afraid of a little confrontation. That's, I'm not saying that is a bad thing. Della, you, you worked with her. There's times when she's got to deal with confrontation. When a, when a mom or a dad walked into that middle school office and said, 
your kid, your principal, that teacher, they loved having Amber sitting in that front seat because Amber was like, let me tell you something about my kids. She wasn't afraid to, to, to put her foot in, step into the ring for, on your behalf. And I can tell you that I, I could joke about the straw thing, and my kids were getting a, and giving her such a hard time about it. As you know, and, and Doug, you're, I can already see you can't wait till after service to say something to her. But I can tell you that when it comes time to pray for you, you're glad she's ready to take her hoops off. And her granny was just like that. Granny wasn't afraid of a little confrontation. Your mom wasn't afraid of a little confrontation. We always talk about Joyce Helen. And when she got through that stage of that time when, when life, when she wasn't always peaches and rainbows, but when she got to that place where she was seeking God, she wasn't afraid to take her hoops off in prayer on your behalf. We have to be of willing to confront those things in this world that are not lining up with the Word of God. We so easily will back down, will cower under the stress of this world, and that's what I have been so excited about watching this this little thing unfold with this young man. I'm not glad that there's a 24-year-old man fighting for his life. But I'm so glad that there's been people that just said, you know what, our brothers and our family, we are praying. And they ha- you haven't seen one tweet saying, separation of church and state. Not one. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, there was another one that, that he uh, was a player that had gotten so hurt to the point where he, got, he had to get his spleen and his gallbladder removed. And he's been the guy who everybody's been like, when I saw him get emotional on TV and talk about prayer, then I knew that's when I had to spring into action. Not being afraid on television to just say, I, there was one announcer who was like, I don't know what to say. I just know the NFL needs to just call this. And that could cost him his job. The network could be like, you don't talk about the football. You don't, you don't tell them what to do. They tell us what to do. But he just wasn't afraid. But, you know, somebody whose name is Booger is probably not going to be afraid of very much at all. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't make fun of his name. Not to his face. He was not afraid of a little confrontation. Paul says we can't be afraid to confront unbiblical ideas that lead to destruction. And that's what these verses in Deuteronomy do. That's a challenge of our families, is that when we we see these things coming in like a flood, it's really, really hard. I mean, we're not through the woods yet. I know my kids are 21 and 23, and if they kind of get irritated sometimes when I call them kids, because they're like, we're grown. I'm like, yeah, sort of. But, you know, if my mom was still living and I said I was grown, she'd be like, eh, sort of. Because y- your kids are always your kids, right? And, and, and so there's this, there's this element, though, that you go, I had to stand and fight at times. And when I confronted things, I wasn't always a, I wasn't the type of person, and this isn't a soliloquy about me, but I wasn't the type of person who was like, the Lord hath said, and the Scripture said it. And I didn't use this as some tool to try to beat somebody into submission. But what we tried to do in our family by embracing God's Word was when something would come up, a song or something, I'd hear something playing in the kids' room. I'd go back there and, you know, instead of being like, give me your device and you're grounded, I'd be like, what are you listening to? And they'd tell me, and I'd say, well, what are the words saying? And uh, honestly, Della, I don't remember if it was your class. You did a lot of stuff where they had to, to, to what do you call that? Analyze. Analyze the music. There's one song, Caden's like, I hate this song because I listened to it 297 yes. times when I was in, in Della's English class. <laughs> but I would ask him, analyze the song. What what are you what is this guy saying to this awesome beat and these cool, you know, electronic effects or guitar solos or whatever? Uh and I had and I'll be honest with you, I go back and listen to stuff that I loved, and I'm like, ooh, what was I listening to? 
man, this song isn't what I think it, this song is not about what I thought it was about. But I had, but being afraid, not being afraid to confront that with your kids or your own desires and habits. And maybe the, maybe it's a, an addiction of some type to anything from something horrible and illegal to ice cream because I love me some ice cream. And I have to question myself, Lord, is this the right thing for me? Do I need Rocky Road or cookies and cream? With marshmallow, extra marshmallows. But God, with this covenant, like I said, it's, it's both of us entering into this covenant, but He's going to fulfill His part. And it's our duty as a part of this covenant to no matter what, even when we're doing all these things that God prescribes for us to do and maybe something, you still get sick. Or there's not a healing. And you're like, man, how did, how did this happen? How, how did this come about? I've abstained from those things that are harmful to me that talks about in these, in these words. Verse 6 says, uh, Deuteronomy 6, it says, And all these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Some people take that real serious, real literally, and you can, it's okay. But some people will get, you know, a tattoo or something that says on their hand or whatever. I, I don't, I'm not saying that you can't do that, but what I'm, I, I believe if you really look at the scriptures, when it talks about putting something between your eyes, it's talking about having it on your mind at all times. Always putting your minds on the things of the Lord. I think Paul said it this way, uh, think upon these things that bring peace and life and healing. <clears throat> it, it, this obedience to God, whether we realize it or not, it's, it's trying to put us in a place to receive His blessings. Now that, that word gets thrown around a lot, probably gets abused a lot, but ultimately His blessings is just giving, getting something added to our lives that we don't deserve. And as far as I'm concerned, the next few breaths that I take, I don't deserve them. Because I don't particularly think that I've done anything just astronomical to change the world. I didn't invent soft serve ice cream like the Dairy Queen man did. I didn't write some book that, like Pilgrim's Progress that, that tons of people read and it leads them to a salvation in the Lord. I didn't preach a message. I have a picture of the, the pulpit that Jonathan Edwards preached. And it says that he never even looked up from it. He sat and read his message as people just, just came and ran to the altars because they just they had to get saved. They had to get saved because they knew that they needed Jesus Christ. I have never done any of those things. But what I know is that God's not a respecter of person. And whether or not you're up here teaching a class or if you're watching online and you've never even been to this church before, God has a plan through these kinds of scriptures to bless you. That's his whole, <laughs> that's what he's been doing with his word since the beginning. That verse 4 and 5, and I kind of I kind of started in verse 6, but it's called the, sh the uh, Shema. That literally in Hebrew just means to hear. Hear this, not background noise, not just something we say, but hear this, repeat it. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and with all of your strength. This is, this is God's gift to us as a part of His covenant. 
that we can receive it. And all it takes is us just honoring Him. Honoring Him through love. It's so difficult when you're trying to counsel anybody. Uh, and, and you guys have all, I'm not talking about spiritually counsel. Like, it's really, it's really hard to try to tell somebody how to, to, to cook something, and they can't cook, right? Have you guys seen the commercial? This one got me this year. Uh, there's a commercial where this young man's trying to cook, and there's kind of a little gray-haired lady kind of standing over his shoulder, and he's, he goes and he adds something, and he's sprinkling, and she kind of hits his arm, and he dumps a bunch of, I don't know, paprika or whatever into the dish, and he gets it all together, and he gets it all done. And then when he shuts the door, you realize that it's, it's not really a person. It's the memory of his mother uh, helping him cook something. And then I saw that. The first time, I didn't really notice it. But the second time I saw it, I was like, <laughs> you know, because I've lost my mother, you know, and my mom was always cooking. We, I got in the kitchen, and I cooked. And then on top all that off, it was a dumb Coca-Cola commercial. And my mom collects Coca-Cola stuff. Like I have a whole storage thing at some point in Abilene I'm going to have to go down to and go through because it's got $40,000 worth of Coca-Cola memorabilia in it that i got to figure out what we're going to do with. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, it, when you don't know what you're doing and somebody's giving you advice and you're not listening, have you all ever given advice and they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh? And you're going, you're not listening to me. I get, I get a call all the time, a technician going, hey, I'm out here and I'm doing this. And I'm going, okay, you know, click on the top left corner and do this. And they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I go, you know what, just share your screen with me. Because I know you're not listening. You're not paying attention. i got to walk you through this. It's very frustrating to try to give people advice when they don't really want to hear it. And that's kind of where we we find ourselves in the world today. As there's a lot of people out there that are saying, how can my marriage get better? but they don't necessarily want to hear, or they hear it, but they don't, they just does, it doesn't sink in. How can, I, how can I help my children that are adults transition to this next part of their lives? And, you know, you go, well, here's what, you know, the Bible says, and you tell them, and then they go, okay, oh, okay, and then they go right out and just ignore it, right? It's not... It's not because people are dumb. It's because that's how we have been conditioned to feel like, well, we kind of already know. Don't touch that one tree. <laughs> exactly. Don't touch that one tree. You can have anything else in the tree. Uh-huh. Okay. But then you go, and the first thing you do is, hey, this tree looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, the, it's the condition of our of our our flesh, right? This flesh, from the day we're born, we're on our way back to the grave. There's nobody yet, except, I guess, Elijah, Enoch, and Moses that didn't get buried. <laughs> There's, but that's just a few. And as far as I know, I have not ever met anybody who just disappeared and went to be with the Lord. We're all in this state of condition that our flesh drives us, it, it hinders us. I, want, I need to exercise, but then my leg hurts. I need to clean, but then my leg itches. That was a joke when Zoe was a little girl. We'd go to clean in their bedrooms, and Caden would be doing his part, and Zoe would be going, ooh. And he'd be like, what are you doing? Oh, my leg really itches. Oh, I just can't. My leg really itches. I loved it the other day because she was babysitting a young girl. And she said, it's time to clean our room. And the girl goes, ah. Never heard the story. It was, I guess it's just built in. They just go, oh, my leg really itches. <laughs> it's built into us to not want to do. Paul says this way, Why? Do I do the things that I don't want to do? And I don't do the things that I know I should do. 
Why am I slave to this flesh? Why am I slave to this body that I'm in? <clears throat> Y'all, I have not even gotten to the second point of this sermon. We have to love the Lord. We have to be willing to listen to Him. Even when it's painful. And here's where I need to get to this. There's single folks. There are There's kids back here right now that are here. Their parents have never darkened the door of our church or any other church. We, I pulled up tonight, and somebody was getting out, and it was a little early. We don't usually open the door until 6.15. And I, I just want to scream, and I just want to go, well, just wait and come to church with them. Don't drop them off. Just wait and come with them. But people are going to do what they're going to do. It's fine. But it's our privilege and our responsibility that, our group as a family gets to pour into those lives that don't look like what I said earlier. I am very thankful. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, I I honestly, I sat around around the Christmas time and I just kind of wept at times because we're in a place right now in our lives where things are just awesome for us. Um, our health isn't perfect, our finances aren't perfect, you know, our kids are going through some things that we wish they weren't going through, all that, but I just, I can't imagine things being a lot better than what they are, Uh, because God's just been so good to us. Pastor, you and I, we're like, man, we're just overwhelmingly thankful. And And I also realize because I, I hear it, Amber's heard it her whole life. Well, yeah, it's easy for you. You got an automatic ticket to heaven because you grew up in a pastor's home. And so I realize that some people will look at us and go, well, you got it. All this. I'm like, guys, listen, I don't even tell y'all half the stuff that my family went through. And so I could get into it. I could spend 30 minutes. But I told Amber this one time because I, I just began, I broke down a couple years ago laying in the bed. And she's like, are you okay? Because you know how you could feel the bed shaking like, like I, I was crying. I was just sobbing and I was trying not to wake her up. And she said, what is wrong with you? You don't ever, like I cry, I might cry at Coca-Cola commercials. But I don't like sob in, in my belly from my gut. And she said, what is wrong with you? I said, it was real early in the morning, and I said, it's like I woke up, and I had this vision. You know when, the, when Satan takes, is in the wilderness with Jesus, and it says he takes him up to a high place. He says, look at all this kingdom that, that could be yours if you would just bow down. I said, I, it wasn't like that. I said, but I felt like I was standing on a, on a peak, looking back at all the adversity of my life. And I realized where God had brought me and how much I had gone through all of that valley and somehow I was here at this peak and somehow God had preserved me for so much. It's, it's, it blew my mind and it just became emotionally overwhelming. So I get that it's easy for me with my, my, my wife and my great kids and the job that I've been thankful to have for almost 25 years and or 24 years, that, oh, well, it's easy for you. You're right. I've had some breaks because the Lord's given them to me. But what it's also able for me to do is to come and stand beside you. So if there's a failure, if there's a gap somewhere in that, in, in that marriage or in, in that child or in one of these kids back here that needs that doesn't have what Caden had growing up, that maybe I get the opportunity because the Lord calls us all together as a, as a family. You know, that the NFL team, the whole NFL was like, we're a family. 
And it's, guys, I'm not lifting. The NFL could be some of the worst. I mean, just you can read their lips on the sidelines, right? But one thing came out was that they all were going to rally around each other. And I thought, how much should the church take note? Because there are people who, they, they want nothing more than to have their kids living for the Lord. They want nothing more than to have uh, their marriage solidified in God. But they don't have it right now. So we get the opportunity as a part of that family to come around, come alongside them, and be a part of that. We don't get to rejoice just in our own righteousness, but the fact that God calls us collectively to be build each other up, to, as the Bible says, bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. We have this opportunity to do that because unfortunately it doesn't come easy. Um, and that's where we got to pray because there's some things we can't get over physically. I can't go out and just shake somebody and go, Stop living like this! I wish you could. There's times where you just go, Whoa, stick your face in this. That's my mom. My mom used to say that. Stick your face in this. But we have to be willing to be disciplined by the word. Chastise. What do all we're all, we're grown. You can't discipline chast yeah, we can. That's what the word does. It gives us um, it gives us the ability to um, to stay in that covenant. I'll read this verse and then I'll have to stop. It's in Proverbs <clears throat> um, chapter one, verse nine. It's talking about our children. It says, For they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. And some of you are like, Oh yeah, my kids were like heavy chains. <laughs> but remember, it's not talking about like Mr. T chains that are heavy and hard to carry. It's just talking about an ornament. Something that you're proud to have, like a pendant. A pendant might be a better word for it because it's something that says uh, that I'm proud of that child. And I can tell you that, uh, uh, Miss Martha, you, you always bless us because you love on my kids so much, even though they're grown. But uh, we moved here. The kids were uh, nine and seven believe it or not, and uh, they just, my kids, the one thing they had going for them is they already loved church, and so they got right in, and they didn't meet a stranger, and so there was a lot of these folks that have been able to see them grow up, and so just, just as I'm proud of my kids, you get to be proud of your kids, or of those kids. I get to be proud of your kids when I see them growing up, when I see young people that were you know, it's funny, Amber and I started in kids' ministry and youth ministry. We were like 19. And so there's these teenagers that were working in the youth that you felt like they were babies or little kids. And now that we're grown, we realize they're only like two years younger than us. And so now we're all the same age, basically. But I'm like, oh, you're so cute. I'm so proud of how you grew up. And they're like, we're the same age. But I truly am proud of what these principles brought to their lives. And that's that's what we have to endeavor to do. So with that being said, again, I didn't get to, to say everything I want to say tonight because I get, I get off into having fun and, and joking around. But we've got four more weeks talking about building up a family. And that's going to be a challenge to the families in this church. Uh, I hope that somebody listens to this and goes, hey, I, I can't be there on Wednesday nights or whatever but I'm going to go back and listen. Or they go, you know what? 
I, I can, that's a somewhere where my family's at right now. We need to come and be a part on Wednesday night. But for certain, you guys that are here tonight, you guys can be praying, can be thinking about that family that you could be praying for, that, that situation that you're going through yourself where you go, I want my family to be built upon this foundation and this covenant of the Lord's goodness. Can we just pray together tonight? Lord, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your word that endures long past. Uh, it'll outlive us, God, if, if you tarry. But God, we just pray and believe that your, your return is even closer than we, we even think. God, I, I believe you're right around the corner. You're so ready to come back for your bride. All the signs of the world point to that. So God, we, we have some urgency. We have some um, expedience tonight because we know that there are families that, that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. There are children that need to hear the gospel. There are uh, uh, relationships that need to be restored. There are uh, grandkids, Lord, that have never had the opportunity to hear this gospel that we want to get that message to them. God, not so we can, we can put a, a, a feather in our cap, Lord God, but so that we can know that every opportunity we had, we capitalized, and God, we made you known above all else. I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful for your promises and of blessing. Uh, but God, I just ask that you continue to pour out for those that are here, Lord God, that are asking for a miracle to happen with their kids, with their grandchildren, with their family. Lord, there's relationships that have been broken for years, but you can restore them. So God, I just ask in Jesus' name that you do that work. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This one last note I read here. Many of you have heard of the French philosopher Voltaire. Uh, it says he lived between 1694 and 1778. He said he hated the Bible. And he's quoted, he said, The Bible, that is what fools have written, what imbeciles commend, and what rogues teach their young children, and are made to learn by heart. He also said, A hundred years from my day, this was in 1776, A hundred years from my day, there will not even be a Bible on earth except one that's looked upon an antiquarian, by the an antiquarian curiosity seeker. Fifty years later, the Evangelical Society of Geneva was printing Bibles on the very press that Voltaire printed all of his works on uh, and has been one of the largest publisher of Bibles ever. And uh, I think most people don't know who Voltaire is, but people know what this Word of God is, even today. I'm glad that, that it's going to outlast every fool's word. It's going to outlive it because we need it. Amen? Amen. Y'all have a great week. We will see you 1030 on Sunday.